Hello, everybody. Welcome. So many familiar faces. I love this. It's such a friendly room. Um, well, it is absolutely my delight to welcome you to our final of the four anti-racist education series. Um, and this week, we are absolutely honored to have Professor Young Sing Wu, um, who will be sharing with us her process of writing a really important article that I first came across uh, in The Current a few years ago. Uh, but briefly, just a few thank yous. I really want to thank Acadia and Open Channel. We have cameras set up. They have uh, graciously uh, recorded each of the sessions so that we can have that wonderful access later. Um, I want to thank you to our museum staff for really helping bring this to life and to the many faculty who have brought your students and to the students for coming week after week. That has been so wonderful to have you here with us. Um, so just to introduce uh, Dr. Wu, who probably doesn't need an introduction for most of us in the room, uh, but Young Sing Wu is professor of English at UL, where she teaches critical theory and U.S. print culture with an emphasis on reading practices. She reads more than she writes, which is not always good for her productivity, but feels strongly that she could always read more. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Wu. Um, so thank you, Callie, um, for setting this up, for asking me, and for bearing with me as I was trying to sort out how I was going to um, organize things and what comments further I would have to say beyond the article that started this. Um, we're going to get to that article and a discussion ar article about halfway through my remarks, so you'll have to wait a little bit. I think it's a, I think it's a pretty good piece, but I wanted to wait because I have some... I have some ideas I've been trying to sort through why it is I don't think of myself as a writer, and that has to do with my identifications, which is where I'm going to start. All right, I'm starting my timer. Oh, sorry. Is, that okay? Ooh. is this better? I'm not going to say everything I said earlier. You, you don't need that. Okay. This is my title, Who Do You Think You Are? A title like who do you think you are, makes a demand on me to say who I think I am, at least at this moment. At least at this moment, I'm Young Sing Wu, professor of English here at ULL. I've identified for as long as I can remember as a reader, far less as a writer. And here are two novels that I'm going to reference later in the talk, but I wanted to showcase them more immediately. They are um, Percival Everett's Erasure. Shout out to Joel for telling me I needed to read it. Um, and then Yellowface by R.F. Kuang. Shout out to Joel, I'm telling you, you need to read it. <laughs> for, as long, for a long, long time, not as long as my identifying as a reader, but for a long time, I identified as a college and pro basketball fan. Rabidly so for the Louisville Cardinals growing up. My family had season tickets. My dad would take himself <laughs> and one of the three of us. So we were on a rotational, which was also a competition. Um, Freedom Hall was awesome in the 70s. The Yum Yum Center is so corporate that it's sad. Um, so rabidly so for the Louisville Cardinals growing up and then during graduate school for the Indiana Pacers. If you are a college hoops fan, I need to tell you I never was a Hoosier, even though I went to Indiana University. I did once see Bobby Knight demolishing a burger at a local restaurant, which was hard to watch. Um, so two pictures here. One to the left uh, is of Daryl Griffith, who during the years 1976 to 1980 came to be known as the Doctor of Dunk. Um, the Louisville Cardinals went on to win their first NCAA championship in the season 1979-1980. I went to all of the home games that season. I think my sisters were just off basketball for a while. Uh, it, was, it was fabulous. Before the word fabulous became a thing in popular culture, it was fabulous. He was known for his vertical leap um, over 48 inches. Um, this pr the photo I wanted, but I couldn't find it, um, was of him doing a backwards alley-oop. This, I think, in fact, was 
Mm, in the round of 16. Um, yeah, a backwards alley-oop. I mean, the, the, the skill and athleticism it takes. Um, yeah, that's Gerald, Gerald Griffith for you. And then to my right is Reggie Miller, who is probably my favorite uh, Indiana Pacers player, not just for his silky jump shot. Um, one of the cool things about his follow-through was apparently he knew exactly when he would, uh, that he'd gotten a shot right if his if he clicked his wrists together. And as you see, his wrists are super bony. Um, so that's very specific. At any rate, I loved him, and I especially loved the relationship he had with the director, Spike Lee, uh, whenever the Pacers would travel to Madison Square Garden to play the Knicks. You could see Spike Lee on the, um, what, right on the sideline, on court practically because he could afford said seats um, and the two of them would just be jawing at each other, trash talking each other. This particular shot is of a moment when uh, the Pacers just stampeded back against the Knicks. Uh, Miller in this particular instance scored, what was it, 10 points, John, in like 20 seconds? Oh, it was amazing. Um, and at his last jump shot, he turns to Spike Lee and makes this gesture. Yeah, so, I mean, Miller, is and was a performative asshole. Um, and I just thought that was awesome. Okay. I've not followed hoops since I moved to Lafayette um, as my sports fandom has shifted to soccer, to the English Premier League, to the National Women's Soccer League, and thanks to the power of streaming to European footy leagues, women's and men's both. This Spanish identification is conflicted. The Qatar World Cup and the aggressive buying of players on the part of the Saudi Professional League is sports washing at its worst. But I have to say I also followed that Qatar World Cup and reveled in watching the sport I love. It is a beautiful game. On the left is Bobby Firmino, who played or played, yeah, no longer. He's now playing for a Saudi team. Um, he played for Liverpool. He was their number nine. He was also a false nine. Um, what you see here is he had a signature move in which after an especially flamboyant goal, he would put his hand over his eye to indicate that he wasn't even looking when he had shot the goal. Um, and then to the right is Wendy Reynard, who is the captain for the women's French national team. She always looks this elegant. Uh, I don't know how she does it. She's especially known for her headers um, when the French team is doing set pieces. All the commentators, all the fans, all the players on the two teams involved know that she's going to get her head to the ball. So what I was trying to indicate to you in these, in these two slides is um, some of my identification resides with sports, and I would never drop that, even as sports, especially professional sports, but you all know college sports too, has increasingly become part of the capitalist machine, which dismays me, distresses me. Okay, so you'll note that none of those identifications include or register explicitly the usual demographic terms, so let me do that. Hence the census, Hence a slight little image of some questions the census might ask or forms that the census might ask. On the welter of forms and paperwork we all face and fill out, I check F, married, and Asian. Those are very familiar to me. Professionally, and by that I mean what I do for a living, these terms do matter. They signify. Let me tell you how. F. I teach women's writing regularly, which includes teaching my students what it means to think as feminist literary critics. This is not a teaching practice that seeks to convert students ideologically. I think that position that um, faculty in the humanities are seeking to convert students ideologically disrespects students who have their own minds and brains, so come on, adults grow up to the adults. Um, so this teaching practice instead seeks to introduce students to an approach towards literature, towards, to a very systemic approach to literature. And I appreciate a couple of the students in the room who just came from my 484 class. F, my current book project is about a moment in feminist literary history when, I argue, reading was recruited to make a political difference, a dynamic that ironically made feminism uneasy about women readers. It's very, very odd. Happy to talk to you about it, um, but, but later. 
uh, married. I am part of a couple in the Department of English. My husband, John Loden, who is here, was hired as a folklorist. And after teaching part-time for a little while, I was brought on full-time. The phrase you might know to capture that is spousal hire. It's a really ugly phrase. At our first departmental meeting, the head introduced me as John's blushing bride. I don't know if I blushed, but the description definitely made me see red. Um, I think she thought she was being funny and complimentary. I did not take it as such. Okay, Asian. I have not, at UL, taught a course focused on Asian American writing. My dissertation director, who knew me well, still sighed when I told her I didn't think Asian American literature would feature in that project. Um, I actually did not write about literature at all, but that's another story. She was worried that search committees would take my name as an indication of my teaching and research interests, as an indication of who I thought I was. She was right. I want to take a detour now and turn to one origin for this identification Diane knew would be assumed for me, whether or not I accepted that assumption. And that's the phenomenon of the Chinese Heritage School. Anyone heard of these things, the Chinese Heritage School? Okay, what, how would you define it? And what about a Chinese heritage school? Oh no, no, it's a thing. It's an absolute thing. Any ideas? Um, I have an analogy with Sunday school working in my head. Someone want to try that out? Come on. Yeah. And it's definitely extracurricular, right? So one is not enrolled in a Chinese school for one's schooling in public education, but it's extracurricular on the weekends. Okay, so I'm gonna take this detour, um, and after the detour I think y'all can probably flesh out or have a more specific understanding of what these things are and why I wanna talk about them. The first thing I remember about my Chinese school is the low fluorescent lighting in the community room school organizers had rented from a local Baptist church. It was the 70s, the post-Watergate pre-Reagan era, and by then, immigration patterns from Hong Kong, the People's Republic of China, and Taiwan had become more diffuse. And in mid-sized cities like Louisville, Kentucky, uh, where I grew up, pocketed populations had emerged. These were not the immersive East and West Coast Chinatowns that we see in movies, um, in other words, and their sensibilities, I mean, Louisville, Kentucky, and a Chinese community sounds like a misnomer. It, it isn't scream, Chinese population. So these were not the immersive East and West Coast Chinatowns, and the sensibilities of these pocketed populations indexed that bicultural fact. The teachers didn't like it, but in the mingling of Chinese and English, we students called it Chinglish, uh, we practiced one version of our heritage. Not the one that they wanted, I'm gonna talk about this in a little bit, but it was definitely one version. I can be more specific. At Chinese school, my classmates and I wrestled with ink-tipped brushes on worksheet after worksheet, following the dotted lines inscribing the proper brush stroke order. So I've to the left is a reproduction of one such worksheet where you can see the character, that's the largest um, item uh, on the block. And then you, what you can see is you can see the progression of strokes that we would be encouraged to mimic in the smaller squares. That particular one, I was so gleeful when I found it, um, the character is the character me or wool. Um, and then to the right are examples of the brushes they're kind of brush-tipped pens, actually, um, that we were allowed to use. You could start with the finest one, 
um, because they were oddly the most forgiving. And then as you gained control, you were allowed to use the broader stroked tipped pens because you had more control. So the saying went. Um, you will note the emphasis on control. We practiced traditional folk dances. Handkerchiefs draped over our wrists to the strains of the Beijing opera. That's the center picture. And you can see that the kids there, um, it's not just their positioning, but we would really literally wear big t-shirts and then these long handkerchiefs. I should have also included a picture of Beijing opera so that you could see what we were trying to resemble. <laughs> Um, and then to the left and the right are just two more random shots um, of the kinds of dances um, you would see at a Chinese school. I would point out the institutional spaces. These are all American Chinese schools, and that's the phenomenon I'm talking about. But you can see that it looks that <laughs> you can see the cinder block um, in the picture in the middle, and then you can see it looks like a whiteboard in the picture on the right. So these are all institutional, not at all glamorous, or I keep on thinking clean hotel, but sorry, that, that's what I meant. Not at all modern, yeah, um, very institutional and Cold War even in affect. Okay, uh, let's see where I am. Also, we rolled out dough into circles thin enough to satisfy visiting grandmothers who then taught us the trick of folding them for pot stickers. There's an entire process. We don't need to go over it. Some of us have come to my house to do it. It's fun. And then we also memorize short poems, usually from dynastic eras, for recitation, and listen to folk tales about the Hua Pui Gui, uh, a ravenous ghost that eats humans and wears its victims' skins. How's that for an imagination? OK, knowing this, I've just given you a glimpse, how would you define a heritage school? And how does such a school define heritage? This is a question. Nice What's that? Nice yeah, it was absolutely a form of indoctrination, yeah. Um, maybe a gentle, kind one with arts and crafts. Yeah, I mean, that was absolutely the move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, exactly. We didn't know we were being indoctrinated. Actually, we kind of did. The Chinese school I went to, which I hated, here's the reason I hated it, um, it took away from reading at home on weekends, which annoyed me, but also it was actually my first glimpse of intra-Chinese politics because in my Chinese community, my Chinese American community, there were folks who had immigrated from Taiwan as well as folks who had immigrated from the People's Republic of China. Those two national entities, or they perceived themselves as such, um, had very conflicting notions of what it means to be Chinese, and they both thought they were right. So to have teachers warring over how things should be taught, I mean, I'm 10, I have no clue what's going on, but I can tell that certain teachers are always grumpy with certain teachers. Um, and that underlying um, mix of feeling uh, definitely made an impression on me. You might like to know that historians of heritage schools trace their arc alongside U.S. immigration legislation. The earliest heritage school mix of sorry that was poor. The earliest heritage school mix of socializing and cultural preservation on the West Coast arose alongside anti-Asian sentiment to the mid-19th century wave of immigrant labor. When the Chinese Exclusion Acts, which were um, passed serially in 1882, 1904, 1911 through 1913, when this series of Exclusion Acts, they were named that, it was about as explicit as you can get, no euphemism necessary, when these acts produced further isolation amongst, immigra amongst immigrants, the Heritage School's pragmatic and ideological centering of cultural preservation found even fir firmer footing. That impulse towards cultural preservation actually continued post-1965, 
gaining steam as the U.S. relaxed its immigration stance and Chinese American families began their move to white dominated suburbs, uh, taking heritage schools with them. By the 1980s, this is my favorite part of this research, even the U.S. government had taken notice and observed that these parallel educational systems demonstrated a unique American ability in foreign language competency. So the very government that excluded Chinese immigrants was by the 1980s saying, hey, look at us, Americans. We know how to teach foreign language competency, and we don't even need to do it in our public schools. Well done. But not surprising, really. Okay. You may know about Maxine Hong Kingston's The Woman Warrior, which I think offers much the same heritage mix. To think in timeline turns, Hong Kingston and I both attended Chinese schools. She in the 1950s in California, me in the 1970s in Kentucky. By the time I started attending my Chinese school in that Baptist church, she had seen The Woman Warrior sell over 100,000 copies. It would be fair to say that The Woman Warrior made a very American splash, published by Knopf, which is um, one of the major corporate publishing houses, reviewing strongly in major outlets, winning the National Book Circles Award, sorry, National Book Critics Circle Award, and appearing on college syllabi uh, within the decade following. Its capture of a more mainstream public fancy meant that The Woman Warrior became a text to be read for American cultivation such that in 1976, the idea of a general reader who was also a book lover encouraged US readers to learn from and to expand their horizons with the woman warrior. That discourse of American cultivation, kind of the melting pot move. Oh, all Americans are interested in all Americans. See the face I just made. Um, that discourse of cultivation dovetailed, interestingly, with the heritage discourse in which my Chinese school and the woman warrior were steeped. Okay, I actually want to look at these book covers a little bit. Um, let's see, published in 1976 by Knopf, so that is the book cover image at the bottom with the maroon background. Um, for those of you who can see more clearly, how would you describe the features of the book cover? I'm going to poke at people in the front. So woman with green hair that I've already admired. Well, what sort of things do you see on that book cover at the bottom? Oh, tell me your name. Meg, thank you. and tell me what, how, describe that building. Meg, would you do that? Okay, look at that building and describe to the rest of the room. This is your moment. <laughs> does, it, does it feel Asian to you? Like, uh, stereotypically Asian? I would say a little bit, yeah. How so? Um, because whenever I do see, like, buildings, and especially in art, it's usually red buildings that are kind of, like, narrow. Okay, okay. You can sit down. Thank you, Meg. I put you on the spot. You did awesome. Okay, um, so these folks who just did a kind of reading or description of the book cover um, capture the novel's interest in thinking about um, Maxine Hong Kingston's protagonist's cultural heritage. Yeah? Okay. And hence the bird um, that's rendered very uh, exotically. Um, hence the figure of the woman warrior who is drawn from the folk tale for Fa Mulan that Disney turned into Mulan. I mean, it was a great movie with great songs, but still. Um, and then the building, I think, is the most ambiguous. I can't decide how Asian it is. It kind of looks like a modernist building to me. I'll let you pause there. 
it kind of looks modernist to me. And so I have wondered to myself, is that a gesture to the Americanness of this memoir, or so-called memoir? Okay, now we're going to the vintage 1977 cover. Y'all see it? It's the one with the white background. Um, okay, woman to the right. Right here, tell me your name. Ava. Ava. Okay, what do you see um, in that cover? Yeah, yeah, I actually prefer this cover. Um, I'm cheesy that way. I know why I prefer it. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to ask you about my cheesiness, but what's the impact, do you think, Ava, of wrapping a young woman who notably is not wearing Chinese traditional garb? Can someone characterize the young woman's dress? I'm not going to poke on Ava because she's talking already. Maria, what is the young woman wearing? Yeah, yeah. Looks like, you know, a sweater with a pleated skirt. It's, it's very Western, at the very least. Okay, so a young woman who looks faintly Asian, wrapped, who's dressed in Western maybe school kit, wrapped in a dragon. Ava, tell us what's going on here, visually. Ah, say more. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, maybe so. Um, I don't know how friendly that embrace is, and I think that's what Ava is touching on. What is, what is that wrapping around? What does it suggest? We would have to read the memoir, I think, to decide to what extent the cover visualizes the relationship between the protagonist and her heritage. Does the, um, hi, Tina, does the protagonist feel that she's being um, imposed upon? Okay, thank you. All right, where am I? So I am trying to sort out why it matters that two rather different discourses about reading, on the one hand, the broad, oh, it's good for all of us to read in order to become cultivated, and then the discourse about heritage that I've been describing to you from my Chinese school, I'm trying to decide why it matters that these two rather different discourses should converge on the woman warrior. Its publication coincided with the moment when Chinese American families, like my own, driven by their own middle class aspirations, like my own, began moving to the suburbs. How might my school, I don't have an answer to this question, but I think it's a good question, how might the school have asked my classmates and I to read Hong Kingston's book? To what extent would the woman warrior have imagined us, the bicultural children of immigrant parents, who spoke more English than Chinese, here I'm talking about the children, not the parents, and who hardly read Chinese, I'm functionally illiterate as a Chinese person, as one of its readerships. We would have read The Woman Warrior in English because English is its native language. I think that's worth pausing over. Uh, Maxine Hong Kingston grew up in a Chinese-speaking family, but she wrote The Woman Warrior in English. So she, her readership is an English reading audience. However much heritage schools have regarded, flipping the page, fostering literacy as an act of away from homeland identity formation, and literature and literary folk tales as vehicles of similar national and ethnic investments. And however much we practice Chinese at Chinese school, the fact remains that none of us could read Chinese. Our base knowledge of character and vocabulary was that limited. Our relationship to our heritage was that refracted. That refraction lived alongside the identification Chinese school encouraged us to learn feel and live by. And for some of us, that aspirational identification, I want to identify with my Chineseness, for some of us, that identification was gratifying and empowering. The school, on this view, offered a safe space, a refuge. It wouldn't have said a form of anti-racist education because that was not in the water or in the air. But um, looking back, I could argue, I think, that the school offered a form of anti-racist education. But flash forward 20 years, the 1990s to Bloomington, Indiana, 
I'm not watching the Hoosiers, I'm reminding you. I've already mentioned that my dissertation didn't feature or focus on Asian American literature. That Diane, my dissertation director, knew how Asian sounding, oops, sorry, knew how my Asian sounding name would be received professionally and therefore worried that the disconnect between my face and my research would, as she put it, put off search committees who were expecting that my face and my research would match. On one occasion when she was super frustrated with me, she said, you're just being stupid. Um, and naively I said, no, I'm not, but she was right. <laughs> Our compromise was that I would read as much Asian American fiction as I could and work up syllabi to showcase I could teach courses in the subject. Diane was being pragmatic and kind, trying to strike a balance between her understanding of the job market and her understanding of me. Those of you who are thinking about having a job, all of us are thinking about having a job. I mean, I think one of the questions you wonder about is, how is this job going to fit me? And then underlying that is, I want a job, damn it. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a real tension that I think Diane was speaking to with me. Okay, so she's being pragmatic and kind. Did it matter that Diane is white? That her feminist deconstructionist stance on identity was one articulated mostly by white feminists. And here I'll admit that feminist deconstructionist stance was super appealing to me, which might say something about my own internalizations, which I'm happy to talk about. Uh, so did it matter? Yes, probably. For those drawn to that stance, its appeal was its emphasis that identity is not necessarily an absolute quality and therefore always mutable. Yet some feminists of color, many feminists of color at that moment pointed out that they did not have the privilege of living that mutability. I have so much more to say about this dynamic because I haven't resolved it in my head yet. Um, and we can do that whenever. Another professor, Eugene Ouyang, with whom I took my one class on Asian American fiction, so I did try, I did, I promise you. He took a very different view about my dissertation choices and said my relationship to my ethnicity was troubled. By trouble, he did not mean the good sort that John Lewis imagined, but he was also right. So both Diane and Eugene were pointing out rightly that I was at a crossroads with an ethnic identity politics. That was painful to hear because it suggested that my refracted, limited identification was not Asian enough. But it was also true. Okay, I noted earlier that I don't identify readily as a writer. For that reason, I think it's strange, maybe a good strange, that I've been able to think about my disidentifications. I, I, what I'm finding when I think about these things is I'm driven by my disidentifications more so than my identifications. Does that make me cranky all the time? I don't know, I don't know. It makes me reactive, I think. Anyway, uh, for that reason I find it, I think it's strange that I've been able to think about my disidentifications in writing. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, thus I wrote the essay, Academic Disidentifications, while I was pregnant with my daughter, Lily. There I tried to suggest that the appeal and failure of a temporary inter-ethnic community described in Gish Jen's Mona and the Promised Land could describe the appeal and failure of the identity politics of diversity so prevalent in the academic sphere in the early 2000s. I think of this essay as an instance of my own education in anti-racism. I am not gonna make you read it because it's totally academic. Um, however, um, I am gonna proceed to an essay I wrote almost 20 years after that fact, which seems to be the increments in which I work um, which is not good for my productivity, but there you have it. Um, I am going to read a piece that I wrote for The Current. I didn't write it for The Current. I wrote it at home because I was really pissed off by a Facebook post, which I'll talk about here. Um, and it became a, another place in which I think I was thinking about my disidentifications. And then I took the step that I rarely take, which is to say I called an editor and said, hey, I have this piece. Can I send it to you? And if you like it, would you publish it? Okay, so here it is. It's not long at all. I think I can read it without getting mad. Whew, okay. So the title is the same, Who Do You Think You Are? Clearly a phrase I've been thinking about for a while. 
One Saturday morning in 2018, I set out to get some coffee after dropping my daughter off for pregame warm-ups. Picture it, the beginning of high school season, a sunny moment filled with promise and jitters. At CC's, itself crowded with people there for a vintage car show, I stood in line, daydreaming and people watching when I heard behind me, chinka chonk, chinka chinka chonk, chinka. I have known noises like that since my childhood in Kentucky. And as was the case that morning, it was a group of kids who stood looking at me as I turned round, who repeated themselves when I said, hey guys, that's really not nice. And when I raised my voice to say that their remarks were racist, a woman swooped in, fierce with anger and self-righteousness, asked me how I dared to speak in such a way, who do you think you are, and that told me that I need to get the fuck out of here. The young woman taking orders was big-eyed and said nothing. I mean, poor thing. She just had no idea what to do. No one said anything to me. I didn't say anything. I took my coffee and left. And then when I got to the soccer field, I cried on a friend's shoulder. When I posted the above, just now, on Facebook in late November 2018, I did so because I was mostly angry with myself. I wrote, I was and I am angry with myself for not making a scene because that moment needed it. I was actually thinking less about the hate speech directed at me and more about an impulse making the rounds at that time about the power of finding and making beauty, joy, and love specifically as counters against the kind of hatred I encountered. That impulse, however generous, however politically powerful, I wrote, was not sufficient because there are times when beauty, joy, and love are not the right response. There are other forms of political being, I wrote, including anger, that are perhaps more productive responses, even if they are riskier, even if they produce discomfort among friends and family. And believe me, they produce discomfort, which was distressing, actually, because it's not about my friends, because they weren't there. <laughs> Um, in 2018, I had come to know incidents like these as occasional, occurring with new, no real consistency, except that they tended to occur in public spaces when I was alone. In November 2018, I had lived in Morton Lafayette for just under 20 years, having moved here with my husband to teach in the Department of English at UL. Only once in a while, I'd heard ugly words uttered at me, as I did at that CC's. But then I would remind myself of the number of times students had approached me to admit at the end of term that they had first wondered what a person with a name like mine could teach them about English. These young people had been willing to reflect on their initial skepticism and decide whether or not it was warranted. They had been willing to think that they perhaps didn't know enough about me before they passed judgment. Okay, it's now 2021 and the occasional incident has become a pattern. It's been almost a full year since COVID-19 uh, appeared on the scene and began to wreak its special havoc. In that time, I've been the object of verbal assault, assault at least once a month. I know this because I started marking it in my planner for me to note and mull over, mostly in private. I write this here, leaving my planner pages for these pages because I'm tired of hearing well-meaning people including good friends who are distressed for me, insist that Lafayette is a good place of good people. I am writing this because I am tired of people asking why I bring up race regularly in conversation. I applaud my 16-year-old daughter for doing the same, even as it has made her friends and school uncomfortable. I am writing this because the claim that this isn't Lafayette makes no sense when it is precisely happening in Lafayette. I am writing this because I am so angry at you, Lafayette, and I want you to know it. Okay, so I have some dates now. February 2020, Target, an older white man, tells me to go back where I came from. March 2020, Albertsons, an older white man, tells me that the Kung Flu is going around. Not even a good pun. April 2020, Albertsons, a younger white woman tells me I think I'm better than she is because I'm wearing a mask and that if it weren't for people like me, dot, dot, dot. May 2020, Target, you're getting a sense of my shopping practices. An older white man asks whether I should be living here since I'm not American. Because I walk around with a shirt that says, I'm fucking not American. I mean, come on. Um, 
June 2020, Barnes and Noble, a younger white man tells me that all immigrants are the problem. Yep, even people who read can be assholes. July 2020, Target, a younger white woman becomes enraged when I ask her children to stop making ching chong noises at me. Yes, this incident sounds a lot like the 2018 incident. Some might call it a pattern, a trope of behavior. August 2020, Shell gas station. An older white couple asks me how long I've lived here. When I say that I was born in the States, in Ithaca, New York, they reply they don't believe me. September 2020, Panda Express parking lot. We spend some time at Panda in my house. Um, an older white man looks at me as I pass him to enter the restaurant and says, slant eyes. The irony is not lost on me. I mean, come on, if you're going to insult me, be funny. I have a good sense of humor. Uh, October 2020, Target, two white male teenagers passing by me, mock, sneeze, saying, Kung Flu. November 19, uh, 2020, Albertsons, an older white man tells me, sorry, an older white woman tells me I should buy the Cajun Coast rice brand, which I do actually, because my people's rice can't be trusted. December 2020, Super One, going through a freezer case, I look up to see an older white woman, she hisses at me. It was a real hiss. I mean, it was angry, it was cutting, it was, she hated me. Um, she hisses at me that the Chinese are ruining the Louisiana crawfish market. I mean, yeah, I know that. Um, she's not wrong. There is a conflict on that economic score. And I know people's lives and livelihoods are part of that mix. Um, I don't get the hatred. January 2021, Chevron gas station. At the pump filling my car, I turn around when an older white man asks me, don't I know I can't drive to China in my Japanese car? I drive a Honda CRV. He drives a Toyota Tacoma. February 2021, sea season. Older white man tells me my people hacked the presidential election and that Trump will be back. March 2021. A few mornings ago, driving out to my daughter's school to pick her up from watching a friend play a tennis match, a car alternated between following and pulling alongside me for at least 10 minutes. Her school is far away. Each time the car pulled alongside me, the driver, an older white man with an older white woman seated next to him, turned to look directly at me, holding my gaze. The last time the driver did so, he made eye contact and mock coughed three times, jabbing his finger at me. That was the instance that prompted me to want to write this. So this isn't ignorance, if ignorance means not knowing better, or not knowing, or lack of knowledge. Uh, it's people choosing to believe certain things, so explaining their behavior as either ignorance or stupidity means they don't have to learn anything from it. They've chosen to hurl that belief at a target with impunity. That's annoying that they can do that with impunity. And that isn't acceptable. I don't dispute that many wonderful people live in Lafayette. I count many of those as dear friends. But I want to remind those wonderful people, I know they are wonderful people because I've come to know them. I want to remind those wonderful people that Lafayette is neither untouchable nor innocent. Okay, don't clap because that embarrasses me. Um, maybe you weren't gonna clap. So this is what I wrote for The Current. Um, when I tell you I was super nervous about even sending it, I don't know how to tell you, but I was. Um, but it was good to write it. And the process of writing, I know, Callie and I thought that maybe we could talk about the process of writing, but most, but maybe we can start with questions you might have for me. At this point, the, uh, the presentation is going to get more interactive. So questions or comments from me um, about what I just read. I can take a break and drink some water. You're doing me a favor. Yep. I appreciate that. Thank you. This is my mother-in-law. Mary. Um, very little. <laughs> the, uh, the Current has a comment section. You have to be a member, I believe, of The Current to register comments. One person who wrote, I know, and one person who wrote, they're both very supportive, I don't know. Um, this is interesting. 
um, a reporter from KATC emailed me to ask if I'd be willing to talk about the piece. I did. He did a little thing on it on TV, but maybe even for the YouTube channel. The response to that was not so nice. Not so nice. I mean, I'm happy. I think the problem there, Tina, my sister-in-law, um, was that I'd submitted to a place that had a readership that already was on the same page with me. And so it went to, when it went to KATC, the response was always going to be more mixed and potentially, and in this case, I can tell you, because he told me about the response. Um, one of them was, what's she doing working in her planner and marking those things? To which I had to say, I'm a nerd. I love my planner. <laughs> I'm obsessive, yes. Um, but yeah. The response was more mixed, and they tilted towards the not so nice. Non-supportive, I would say. Yes, Joel. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually rereading Trip Master Monkey on the side after I finish Erasure, so it's really your fault um, that I'm not getting through Trip Master Monkey. Um, I'm interested in, in Trip Master Monkey because its protagonist is a writer, um, and I'm a fan of metafiction. Um, my particular angle on metafiction right now is representations implicitly or explicitly of reading. So that's where, that's where my eye is. Um, my beef with the woman warrior is less with the woman warrior than its particular reception and imposition on me. So yeah, I mean, I, it's been wielded over me <laughs> like a, I don't know, like a wet pot sticker. Um, and, and that's, been, that's been very, very frustrating. Um, I didn't want to be a token, is what I'm saying to you professionally. Um, but I also knew the power of that, and that's something that I'm grappling with now. I think largely as a function of the junior colleagues I have right now, like you and Maria and David, who have reminded me that that kind of work can be effective, even after more than 20 years, I feel like I'm just slogging. So to be reminded of that power, um, is 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 as energizing. Yeah. Mm, 
because I'm feeling more positive, um, I would point I would point you to that novel Yellow Face. So this is the novel by R. F. Kuang, who up until the novel Yellow Face had published a trilogy, a fantasy trilogy called The Poppy Wars, which is so our, our daughter tells us an actual take on Chinese uh, World War II history, which. I know nothing about, but she does, which is awesome. Um, so when Kuang moves to Yellowface, it's a it's a it's about commodification of literary property in the form of the author who might not be Asian. So it's a it's a play on and critique of authenticity, ethnic authenticity, and the appetite for ethnic authenticity. Go get it. Yes. <laughs> nope, no healing. No, no, I have not gone that far. Uh uh. Um, I'm willing to put some Neosporin on the wound. I'm not picking at it as much, but no, not 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 anywhere near near healing. Maria knows this. This is this is my this is our discussion about trauma with Melanie. Yeah. We love you, yeah, we, we love you, Melanie. <laughs> I mean, that Melanie can think that that can happen is is a good sign. We we share a student who's working on a dissertation about um, trauma represented in Black women's writing and the prospect for healing and I keep on pushing and saying how do you know how do you know and I've learned from Melanie she doesn't know but she wants to believe uh, that's I, I you know she's stronger than I am in that score yeah yeah thank you yeah Uh, yeah. So it doesn't have to be a position of mm -hmm. um, What she said, and then I would add, it's so exhausting, though. <laughs> <laughs> If I feel differently, um, it's m maybe to Maria's point that they're more elastic now. When 20 years ago, that disidentification, I was really rooted in it. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, so um, who was annoyed with that feminist deconstructionist stance? I'm trying to think now. I'm trying to think now. I can only think of who wasn't, because those are the ones I was excited by. I, Horton Spillers was not um, annoyed by it. Strangely enough, Nellie McKay wasn't annoyed by it. Um, well, we, we could talk later about that. Anything more about the essay I read to you? Because we can move on now. Shall I move on? Oh, question, yes. Yep. 
Huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. I agree. Yeah. I don't know when it's going to stop, but I have been tracking all day long Kevin McCarthy's status. Um, and uh, yeah, it doesn't look good for McCarthy. I don't know what that means for the rest of us, but it doesn't look good for McCarthy. I don't even know if it means anything. Okay. Um, bef can I shift gears now? Okay, so before shifting gears to the artwork I've chosen to think about with you today, I have to do the, mm, not teacherly, but good friend readerly move and tell you about the two novels I think you should put on your holiday reading list. No, not that. Here we go. R.F. Quang's um, Yellowface and Percival Everett's Erasure. So let me give you a little bit of a plot summary, um, and I think it'll be clear why they sound so compelling, or they are compelling. So in Yellowface, Two young writers, Athena Liu and June Hayward, have known each other since their college and MFA days. Athena's work has taken off, making her the darling of the literati, while June's has not. In a rather sudden plot twist, June witnesses Athena's accidental death. Really, it was accidental. There's no mystery at the heart of this. Um, and an even greater twist, June steals an almost finished manuscript from her friend's apartment and publishes, publishes it under her own name, or an ethnically ambiguous name, Juniper Song. So this novel, a narrative about Chinese workers serving in the British Army during World War I, immediately makes June, now Juniper's name, and begins, perhaps not surprisingly, her downfall as she's asked to prove over and over that she is an authentic author who really can write about a history not her own. So yeah, and it's, it is so cutting and sharp about the publishing industry and its embrace of uh, ethnic authenticity or its belief that it can embrace it and monetize ethnic authenticity. Okay. And my claim is that both Kwong in this novel unravels ethnic identification, as does and I really should have put this first, but I read Yellowface first because he's been writing for a far longer time. This is Purcell Everett's Erasure. Thelonious Ellison is a novelist and professor of English whose struggle is also defined by so-called authenticity. In Ellison's case, he knows his writing, which is abstract, postmodern, and highbrow literary, doesn't meet what publishers and readers currently want from black writers. In a bit of a writerly fit, Ellison writes what he intends as a parody of the black writing he disdains, only to see, only to have it to see it picked up by Random House and explode on the scene. So, I read uh, Yellow Face in two days. It's that good a read. I was on vacation. Uh, I started Erasure on my flight to a conference last Thursday. I picked it up again yesterday on my flight back to Lafayette. I would have finished it, but I was so tired that I fell asleep. That's not on Erasure. That's on me not getting enough sleep. I've just finished reading the novel in the novel. So it's the novel Ellison writes, which is titled My Pathology. And I'm now observing its ascent to the literary stratosphere and the havoc that ascent is beginning to wreak on Ellison. So, so good. I'm going to teach them both, I think, next semester. Yeah, they're both on my list. Yeah, and Joel's going to tell me how well this teaches, because he's featuring it in his class. OK. Transition. I'm going to mention Joel again. Um, I have him to thank to remind me that I needed to read, er, read Erasure. I hadn't started the novel when I visited the Hillier to decide on what artworks I shared with you, but I think Everett's protagonist, Thelonious Ellison, whom family and friends call Monk or Monksy, would have a good bit to say about Noel Anderson's pieces. And Noel Anderson is the artist I've chosen um, to talk about with you. Thelonious Monk, or sorry, Monk, is as aware uh, as Anderson is of the presence of black culture, blackness in popular culture, um, as aware as Toni Morrison is uh, in her collection of essays playing in the dark. Monk, I think, as is as ambivalent about this presence as Anderson. As much as there is to admire and celebrate, there is also reason to take a step back, to assess, even to protest. 
Okay, so we're go I'm going to click through some slides really quickly while I read, and then I'm going to come back. When I visited the Hilliard, oops, yeah, I asked Callie if the museum was featuring works that forefronted the medium of paper. I asked her that because paper is the medium that's been super important to me because I read. Um, I spend most of my time these days in front of a screen, um, but I still have strong feelings about paper, strong good feelings about paper, except for paper cuts. Callie brought me to a couple of pieces downstairs, which I admired and found meticulous and beautiful. I could have talked about those for sure, but when she brought me upstairs to the Noel Anderson cluster, which is behind you, I told her immediately, these are it. Some of this is due to pure coincidence. It turns out that Anderson is a printmaker from Louisville, Kentucky, where I'm from, and he went to my same high school. It's so strange. He's now teaching at NYU. He's done super well for himself. Um, and it turns out, this is the one, I think the last one, yeah. And it turns out he's a basketball nerd. So the coincidences are pretty spectacular. Um, all right. I want to take a look at a couple of these basketball slides because they feature shoes. OK, I'm going to start, and then I'm going to ask for some help. Um, this one, you can see he's titled it, so he's given us some help. This is a um, image of Spud Webb's feet. Y'all know who Spud Webb is? Who is Spud Webb? Yeah, super short basketball player. Play, he had a fairly decent NBA career, and at least at one time, he won the dunking contest. So he was an, he was an all-star, at least three seasons. Point guard, I mean, even um, in NBA, well, especially in NBA measures of height, I mean, he was, he's maybe 5'6". Yeah, so he's very short. Um, but he won the dunk contest and clearly made it a splash. And so here is Spud Webb. What part of his body does this piece emphasize? Can you see? Oh, look at the calf. Look at the calf, he shouts. And so we're talking about the lower half of his legs. Yes, clearly Spud Webb had to have had super powerful calves because he had, he had the ups, right? Okay. Um, so let's keep that in mind. Um, can you see that? Somebody said shoes. I don't know your name. Sarah. Okay, so Sarah says shoes. She's right. And they, would you, could you describe the shape of the shoes? High tops. High tops. Tina, your eyes are so good. <laughs> yeah, high tops. Okay, so these are basketball shoes. Okay. Um, can you see anything there? Yeah, shoes. And guys, I forgot to ask, but in this one, as well as this one, um, what is the angle at which you see these shoes? How has Anderson positioned the shoes in these pieces? This is my face for position. Yeah, 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 side and underside, which means that the viewer, what's the viewer's relationship to said shoes? Like, where am I in looking at these shoes? I am lower. because. Because the dude is jumping over me, or the height that he can attain is over me. Okay. Um, is there another one? No, not that one. We'll, t we'll talk about that one later. No, these are, these are more direct. Is that one? No, I'm not going to look at Hampton's feet. This one. No, no, not that one. Ah, this is my favorite. Okay. Maybe because it's the most clear. All right. So what's up with the shoes, then? These are all basketball shoes. What's up with the shoes? I'm going to give you a premise. One of the things that Anderson says about his work is that he's invested in thinking about blackness in popular culture, uh, starting with the premise in these works that sport occupies a domain in culture in which black men specifically can be understood to dominate. Okay, with that in mind, what's up with the shoes? You know, what, what the emphasis, I mean, he's repeating himself. So what's up with the shoes? They're big shoes, okay. Huh? Oh, there are no logo, okay. What? Ah, interesting. Tell me your name. Sorry. Um, 
what's up with Jacob noting there's, that there's no logo on these shoes? What is that telling us about shoes in contemporary popular culture? They're all branded, yeah. So he is absented logos, and yet I think he's still making a point by absenting them, yes? We're so accustomed to seeing, especially basketball shoes, um, with prominent logos. They are corporate. Yes, they are objects of capitalism doing its very best to convince us of certain things. Okay. Um, what else do I want to suggest? What do these shoes and their positioning suggest about the black male body? And I'm not pulling this out of the air. This is something that I've read from Anderson in a couple of interviews. Um, that his interest in taking up sports as a domain in which black men can be understood to dominate, that that interest has uh, drawn, has driven him to represent the black male body in particular ways. Oh, can you say more? I have an idea of why you might say uplift, but the term uplift, what, what, why, are you, why are you tapping it? Okay, yeah, in fact, um, Anderson apparently thought when he was younger that he was going to play either professional basketball or football. I mean, he's from Kentucky. Basketball and football are huge, um, as I admitted early on. Yeah, so personal uplift, yes. And then the phrase uplift is so tantalizing given the positioning of shoes in these pieces. Somebody flesh that out for me? I'm not really teaching a class, sorry. <laughs> Uplift and these shoes. Yeah. 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 Magic. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we have, you'll know, Air Jordans. I mean, they're called Air Jordans for a reason. And perhaps Anderson is tapping that in. Um, the positioning of shoes he has chosen. Um, another commentator in my reading about Anderson said something about the black male body suspended in air. Um, and that led me to think about a possible tension at work um, in these shoes pieces. So I'll say the phrase again. The black male body suspended as if gravity doesn't matter. What's the phrase that gets used to describe the ability of a person um, taking a leap from outside the free throw circle, right, towards, I mean, there are pictures of Jordan doing this, towards the basketball hoop. What's the phrase to describe the ability to suspend oneself? Hang time, yeah, okay. So I wanna think then about hang time as a phrase that also describes um, another form of suspension to which the black male body has been subjected. Because I think that's available too in these pieces. Yeah. 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 Ava. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we don't have to describe, and I decided not to include any photos, but yeah, I think the resonance is there. I mean, we have colloquial made hang time a compliment. Dude's got hang time. Um, but that phrase can also describe a historical phenomenon, fact, um, in the US. And insofar as Anderson is commenting on popular US popular culture, we also know that lynching was part of US popular culture. People went to them, yeah, attended them, bought postcards in them. These are all things that you know. Okay, let's think now. I wanna think now about the medium um, of some of these and we'll stay with these uh, shoe pieces. Um, so this one, untitled, is picked and distressed stretched cotton. 
and I totally invite you to go back and look at them later. Um, not that one, 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 no. Dyed and distressed stretch cotton tapestry. Also the same. And handmade paper. I'm especially interested in what he does with cotton. A, that he's chosen cotton, and B, what he's done with it. So, so cotton died and distressed. Callie helped me to understand that by distressing, one of the things Anderson does is to, after he's reproduced the image on the cotton, I'm going to call it canvas because I don't have any words for that, um, he regularly then takes some kind of instrument, so I'm thinking like, I don't know, um, like a pick or something, and picks on the threads so that there isn't a, a textural effect of unraveling. Okay. A fine crochet hook would work. Okay, awesome. All right, so cotton, and then distressing the cotton. He's working with a medium and then distressing it. So let's start with cotton. Anyone want to speak that loadedness, please, so I don't have to? Go, Ava. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 I don't think I need to say anything. Thank you, Ava. Did you all hear her? Kind of, sort of. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, you made me think just now listening to you talk, she used the phrase picking cotton when she's describing what Anderson is doing to the cotton he's chosen to make as medium, but picking cotton. So nice, thank you. That's very helpful. I mean, I'm smiling because I think that's, that's so cool. That's very good. Um, yeah. Let us now move on to two more pieces. How am I for time, Kelly? Yeah, OK. I can just do one, because this, this is my favorite one. No, that was not my favorite one. That is not my favorite one. Yes, OK. When I walked through with Callie, um, she explained to me that this is an image. It's made, the object is made of paper that no, uh, Anderson himself has made. And it's an image of a Dogen, which is um, a sculpture made by the Dogen people in West Africa and Mali. Um, I can't say much more about this tradition in sculpture, um, but what Callie told me was that Anderson had a practice of going to the Met where this particular Dogon had been on display, and that he would return regularly to observe and think through and mull over. Um, and that was the ground for this particular piece. Um, the actual piece, the arms are upraised more vertically. So in his distressing um, of this image, he's made the arms shift a little bit. They're kind of wavy, aren't they? OK, um, and he has given it the name Hands Up. OK. <laughs> so partially, he's not being overly subtle, but it seems that it's important that he's taking an African sculpture, working with a medium, taking an image that he's then manipulated um, to what? Offer a comment on a fact of what the image is doing but also a fact of, help me out. You don't have to laugh anymore. You're, you've done all the work you need to do for today. <laughs> hands up. Yeah. yeah. Hands up or I'll shoot. Yeah. 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 OK, so this is the last bit. Um, Callie told me in one conversation that the anchoring quote for this series uh, yokes education to freedom, specifically the claim that education is the practice of freedom. The idea of practice really speaks to me because it emphasizes the repetition 
the time put in, the work that freedom requires, being anti-racist requires similar practice. And now I'm done. long, I'm sorry. No. You should have known better. I love worksheets. Not those, but I love, like, in language classes, I, I love worksheets. That's great. In person, he's going to be here. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.